Good afternoon, everyone. I'd uh, like to call the February 25th school board meeting to order. Thank you all for being here. We just came out of executive session discussing uh, matters of, of importance to the district and the board. Thank you for your patience while we deliberated on those very, very important issues. Welcome this afternoon. At this time, we're going to stand and we're going to have an inspirational moment and Pledge of Allegiance by Dr. Bill Fleming. Well, um, I ask uh, Libby and the people around me if there's anybody. We haven't had anybody that uh, any tragedies were very fortunate. Maybe snow days were good for something. We were very fortunate not to have too many uh, mishaps in the last, uh, since we last met. And we just want to thank, be thankful for everything that we have done since then, since the last time we met, and thankful that we did get through those times relatively unscathed. Let's just, let's just thank, thank, be thankful for that. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you very much, Dr. Fleming, for that. We appreciate that so much. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion to approve uh, the agenda. Second. Second. Been moved by Ms. Spector, second by Mr. Manning. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, we're ready to vote. motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Let me also mention that um, uh, we did receive word from Mrs. Anderson that she was not able to be with us on tonight, so we certainly wanted to know that we miss her and miss her presence from being a part of our, our meeting on this afternoon. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items. So moved. It's moved by Ms. Spector. Second. Second by Mr. Manning. Is there any further discussion from the board? Hearing none, we're ready to vote. Thank you very much. A motion passes 6 0. Next on our agenda is our special recognition. Dr. Ham? Yes, I'd like to call on our executive director of community relations, Libby Roof, to make our special recognitions this evening. And I think we're going to move around. Is that for our special recognition? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. y'all can move around. And board, if we'll move around uh, to the front seats. And the board member, Miss Elkin Johnson, you can go on stage with um, Shelly. Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Ham and staff and guests. Tonight we are recognizing members of our Richland II family for achievements in music and sports. As I call folks forward, I would like to tell you a little bit about each of our honorees. And I think my staff told you that we're gonna use this staircase over here to get to the stage. First, we will call up Blythewood High School senior, Markel Batts. And he will be accompanied by Principal Keith Price. Marquell is being recognized for his acceptance to the U.S. Army All-American Marching Band. In addition, he participated in the U.S. Army All-American Bowl Game last month in San Antonio, Texas. Marquell is a fourth-year member of the Blythewood Blue Legion Marching Band. Approximately 125 participants are chosen from thousands of applicants across the country, and Marquell is one of two students chosen from South Carolina to participate in this prestigious event. Congratulations. <clears throat> and 
And now we have another musically talented student to honor, Spring Valley High School student Troy Herman. Please come forward along with your principal, Dr. Baron Davis, and band director Dave Allison. Troy has been selected to play the French horn with the 2014 Honor Band of America. This is a very elite ensemble, which is selected from a very difficult and highly scrutinized audition process. Troy will perform with the National Honor Band this spring in Indianapolis. In addition, Troy is the principal horn player in the South Carolina Philharmonic Youth Orchestra and the Charleston Wind Symphony. He is a four-time member of the South Carolina All-State Band and organization orchestra. Congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Davis, do you want to stay up there for, for the next one? And we'll ask his, uh, the Spring Valley track coach, John Jones, to please come forward. Coach Jones has been selected as the 2013 National Federation of High Schools Coaches Association's National Coach of the Year for Boys Track and Field. This isn't the first Coach of the Year honor Jones has received. He received the South Carolina Coach of the Year for Boys Track and Field last year. Jones has been at Spring Valley his entire 34-year teaching and coaching career. And in that time, he has won five state championships, including the 2013 4A state championship. Jones was inducted into the South Carolina Track, Track Coaches Hall of Fame in 2007 and was inducted into the South Carolina Athletic Coaches Hall of Fame in 2009. Congratulations. One area that often goes unrecognized is athletic field maintenance, but not tonight. I'd like to call up the district stadium and turf manager, Billy Patowski, who will be accompanied by the district's turf management group, Stan Ford and Larry Medlin and Ronald Howard. Mike Weber and Milton Herbert were not able to be with us. The, these men oversee 42 sports fields in the district. Accompanying them is Executive Director of Operations, Jack Carter. <laughs> this excellent crew has been notified that not one, but two of their stadiums have won Fields of Excellence Awards from Pioneer Athletics. The District 2 Stadium 3 at Westwood and Harry, Harry Perrone Stadium which serves Spring Valley and Richland Northeast High Schools, were both selected for displaying a commitment to excellence. Only 82 athletic fields around the country were selected, and Richland, too, has two of them. Thank you for exemplifying teamwork and excellence. Another achievement that the district is feeling very proud of is its contribution to the United Way campaign this year. Our employees, including teachers, administrators, and staff, generously donated more than $92,000. We welcome Mac Bennett, President and CEO of the United Way of the Midlands, to recognize our top schools and centers. Well, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here, um, especially when I can announce that Richland School District 2 is back on top of the seven school districts in the Midlands. Richland School District 2 raised more money this year than any other school district. So uh, we, uh, we're going to try to duplicate uh, your superintendent's uh, efforts and uh, see if we can raise the competition across all the districts a little bit. But the great campaign. and. Um, the superintendent, uh, if we could get all the CEOs in our community to agree to wear pajamas to their <laughs> divisions that uh, perform above and beyond, then we could raise about $2 million more in our community every year. So we've got to 
uh, figure out how to make that work across all of our campaigns. But thank you, uh, Superintendent Ham. A great, great campaign, great leadership. We uh, do want to recognize a few things here tonight, and I'll just take a few minutes. I think the first slide is going to recognize our schools that had 10% increases. And if you've never run a campaign, a 10% increase in giving at a, at a school or a corporate division is a a huge increase so we re we recognize those schools and uh, thank them for their special efforts and then we had almost one quarter of the schools in the district had tw had a hundred percent participation of all of their staff so we've got the next slide I think we'll recognize those schools 100 percent participation that's a big deal Then we want, wanted to recognize uh, four schools for efforts uh, really above and beyond. Um, we want to recognize W.R. Rogers Center, and I'm going to have to put on my glasses because the type gets a little small here, but they had 100% participation per capita of $79 per capita. I uh, want to recognize them for a great campaign. <coughs> Well, let me, I guess we're going to get to that in a minute. We, we have per capita awards, and these are, have been delivered to the schools, but in the bronze category, uh, the Center for uh, Cre Accelerated Preparation at Cle and the Clemson Road Child Development Center, Longleaf Middle School, W.R. Rogers, and then uh, for the 10% increase um, award, Clemson Road Child Development, Condor, Kiels, and Westwood. So just wanted to recognize those schools. And then we have, as I was mentioning a moment ago, four schools that have uh, had superior performance that we want to recognize. Uh, the first is W.R. Rogers. Um, and again, 100% participation. And per capita, 79% is, there, uh, is the principal or the ECD here to accept the award? Good. Dr. Cunningham? Great campaign. Thank you very much. Next we have the best elementary school, Killian Elementary School. They had total giving of over $3,200, participation 100%, and per capita giving of $45. Is uh, Dr. Scotland here? And his ECD or his campaign coordinator, Wanda Price? Next, we have the best middle school, Summit Parkway Middle School. Uh, total giving almost $2,000. Again, participation at 100% and per capita giving just over $20. Excuse me, and the principal is here to accept that award. Last but not least, our best high school uh, goes to Westwood High School and Principal Ralph Smith here to accept uh, almost $4,000 in giving, 58% participation per capita giving of $27.
one, we're going to go to the next slide and recognize, oh, oh, let's try one, what next slide? The, the final thing we want to do, when we had our big finale downtown, we recognized the school district and the, the volunteer that uh, led this uh, campaign for all of our public, public uh, activities in the community gets to select a best campaign. And this year, that volunteer, that chairman of our public service uh, division selected Richland School District 2 as the best campaign in that division. So again, want to recognize uh, the staff that participated in, in running the campaign, Ms. Baker, and, and the superintendent for her great leadership. Um, it's not possible to have a great campaign without great leadership, and these two uh, ladies did a phenomenal job of, of getting the staff behind the camp, the faculty and staff behind the campaign and doing a great job to administer the process. So congratulations, Richmond School District 2. United Way's work is not possible without our donors. We have about 45,000 donors. Over 2,000 of those come from this school district. We're excited to be a partner with you uh, in many aspects of our work, but uh, we appreciate the support that we receive from the district every year, and we appreciate the great leadership that you provide in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bennett, for coming out and make that special presentation. And let's just take one more time to give one big round of applause for all of our award winners. Tonight. Uh, I, I do want to just take a minute and say thank you to Mr. Bennett for being here. And this truly, you saw all the schools that were recognized. It was a team effort, and I want to thank everybody because it took the whole team to make this happen. So thanks, everybody. That concludes the student recognition portion and board. I think you can stay here now for the uh, Dr. Hamilton, the student focus part. Sure, this is I guess it is on. I'm, um, Mrs. Millett will be introducing the Richland Northeast folks who'll be doing our student focus. Thank you, Dr. Ham. It's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, the principal, Sabrina Suber who will then introduce some of the folks. You have a special treat tonight. Um, they're doing their spring play called Hairspray, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Suber. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Ham, the school board, and the executive team. Tonight, the Palmetto Center for the Arts Theater Depart Department is happy to present two excerpts from our upcoming production of Hairspray, the musical. Featured first is Nicole Siebels in the role of Motormouth Mabel, singing an excerpt from Big Blonde and Beautiful. And featured second are Hannah Barton, Amanda George, and Emily Nielsen in the roles of high school students, Tracy, Penny, I'm sorry, Penny and Amber, singing an excerpt from Mama, I'm a Big Girl Now. Join our PCA and Richland Northeast students as they present the big show with the big hair. The winner of eight Tony Awards, including Best Musical, Hairspray is a family-friendly musical piled bouffant high with laughter, romance, and deliriously tuneful songs. Wear your best beehive and come have a jiving good time with us. Our show runs from March 20th through March 23rd with our Richland Northeast Foundation's dinner and show, taking center stage on Saturday, March 22nd. Now I give you PCA.
Wow, what an exciting performance, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Ms. Sabrina, for excellent job, Ms. Uber, for uh, making us uh, enticed to come out and be a part and participate in later in March. So thank you very much for that. Also, certainly want to thank you, Mr. Bennett, in his absence, he's already left, for recognizing the outstanding work of this district. And uh, it's certainly, certainly reflective of the, the caring community that, that we're so proud to be a part of. I find it unselfish uh, to, uh, to to give of themselves to help those that are certainly in need. We certainly want to honor, honor those two young men who are musicians who have achieved a national recognition for uh, for the outstanding musical performance. So thank you very much for that. Uh, at this time, uh, next we have our public participation session. Two individuals have signed up, and I will call your names, and you will come up to the mic to the podium. Please be aware that you have three minutes to. Uh, address the board. The board will not respond to your uh, comments tonight. However, if it is appropriate that a written response be provided, one will be provided to you uh, after the after the board meeting at, at a later time. Thank you very much. At this time, our first person is, uh, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's, I think it's Kitty Johnson. Am I saying that correctly, Ms. Johnson? Katie, I'm sorry. Katie Johnson. Come up to the mic. My name is Katie Johnson. I'm in here with mm -hmm. reference of my great grandson that's been living with me all of his life, whose dad has forsaken him, and I've taken the responsibility at the age, pretty old lady, at the, when they burned him in the house. And today I made his seven, and he's being exposed, ex, uh, expelled, a, ex propulsion from Dent Middle School. He's 12 years old and very small frame little boy. A very small boy. He's been cutting grass and raking straw since he was nine years old to make his own money to buy his own games and things to play with. And he's been scared to death to go into dance school because so many people have bullied him, bullied him. They bullied him all in the school. They bullied him out in the community. And I had a great grandson and great granddaughter. And also my granddaughter moved in the house with me in August and they were the worst people I should have ever had to come into my house. They was homeless, and so I thought of, as a Christian, I was doing my very best mm -hmm. trying to help them, but you can't help some people. And these people took and put this little boy completely down. They bullied him, they threatened him, they had people in the community that threatened him, they had people in the school that threatened him, and the little boy was scared to death to go to school. He got so, and I'd wake him up at six o'clock, so I'd get ready to eat breakfast and go to school, catch the bus, he would just cry, cry and cry. I said, what's wrong? Grandma, I'm scared to go to school. They're going to beat me up today. So they said they're going to beat me up today. They're going to kill me. They're going to hurt me. If this went on and went on and on. Well, I thought that the child was just putting all this stuff, just putting it on, just to be putting on something. But I come to find out it was true. I found out the people that was living in the house with me was putting a lot of people up in the neighborhood, some in the school, not only in Dent, but also in Richard North East School also is putting them up to meanness. So I have went through a lot with the little boy. Mm -hmm. I'm here to try to get him back in school because he's a very small boy. He shouldn't be out there on the streets of South Carolina at his age and the size he is because somebody's liable to kill him. They're liable to hurt him because there's too many gangs around. We have gangs in our territory because the sheriff told me so. We've had seven incident reports been called there on the family that was living with me. They have knocked holes in my wall, taken a fist and just hit the rock sheet, made hole, and I tried to get them out. The sheriff couldn't do anything about it until I was taking it up with the magistrate. Mm -hmm. And so I had had to get them evicted. The teenage boy that comes to Rich and Northeast, he pushed me down in the house. And also the little girl that goes to Dent, She's 13. She pushed me down. They were very violent. And the mother that was there, which is my granddaughter, she was living with us because she was recovering from cocaine. And she was, I don't know, she was just couldn't manage them at all. And she was just cussing, going with them. It was just awful the way she cussed and the way these two children cussed. The boy, 15, he was on alcohol and pot. <laughs> he tried to get 
my little great grandson just taking smoke pot. He tried to get him to, dr to drink alcohol, and the boy wouldn't do it. So they told him that they were going to take him, beat him up, and they was going to have other people to beat him up. Okay, my 13 year old granddaughter, she, t she took and pushed me down. So they were very violent people, and I didn't know it until after I got them in the house and trying to help them. And I'm here trying, begging, mercy, please help me get him back in school. He doesn't need to be on the street with the gains. He needs to be in school. And if you can't get him back in den, please find somewhere to put the child because he needs to be there. He's a good boy. He's a very sweet boy. He was on the VA honor roll at Kiel's. He, he has... He has had some good reports, and everybody around in our neighborhood that really is nice people, they praise him to the very highest. They all love him. And he's got so, he goes and do free work for some of the people in our community. He'll go and rake the straw or put the trash can back in the yard. He's a very nice, sweet boy. And if you see him and meet him, you would love him. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Our next. Requested to participate in public participation is Mr. Will Pope. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board, members, and staff. Uh, I'm Will Pope. I'm a uh, program director for our student mentoring program here in the local community area. And I wanted to um, kind of continue a uh, discussion on the seriousness of, of recent act of gang violence uh, and bullying in school. As we all know, bullying is a, is a very serious incident. It's plagued many of our schools here in the district. And um, it's, it is with sincere concern that I address this issue mm -hmm. uh, as a responsibility all educators have with regard to doing what we can do in, and taking the measures that we need to take to prevent it. Not only just to prevent it, but eliminate the threat. The threat is very real, and very dangerous. Uh, recently, my, um, the student that I mentor was recently uh, expelled from school as a result of him bringing weapons to the school, which is in direct violation of the <clears throat> Regional District 2 student guidebook. Um, in all rights, the school reserved the right to, in all respects, the school reserved the right to expel him in that regard. However, the reason why he uh, brought the weapons to the school was in fear of being bullied fear of being further threatened by students that have been bullying him in, over the course of the school year and years prior to that. Um, my concern lies not just with the issue of bullying, but how the school officials at the principal level, at, I'm sorry, at the district level, down to the principal, co-principal, uh, those delegated faculty members and staff who have a responsibility to explore or interrogate or look into the school uh, issues as it relates to bullying, as well as the resource officers, the deputy sheriffs that are placed strategically in those schools uh, to deter crime. Um, my concern is that there's four categories I want to address for the sake of time. I know that uh, You've got about a minute and 40 seconds. Yes, sir. Uh, filing up a complaint, interrogations by school personnel teachers, searches and bullying. These are extract categories that I've extracted from the student guidebook that I would like to request that the board look seriously into as to how the process is being handled to where a level of accountability uh, that's measurable, that's able to be documented and reported uh, so that <clears throat> before decisions are made to expel students, we can ensure that those officials are following those policies and procedures exactly in each category to afford those students who file complaints or address that they're being threatened or bullied can get the justice that they deserve. Um, there's a lot of cases out there uh, that, you know, it's, there's, it's, it's easy just to expel a student, but the, the problem still lies there. So I'm just proposing that the board look further into the uh, process, how the process is handled. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Thank you very much. Um, these are the two individuals who signed up to speak to the board tonight. Uh, however, the, the, the board will entertain any individual in the audience if there's someone who did not sign up but would like to address the board at this time. If there's anyone who'd like to do that, if you come to the board, to the mic. If not, thank you very much. Next on our agenda would be the voting on the executive session items. The chair will entertain a motion on student appeals. Mr. Yes, chair, uh, I make a motion that student number one, 
attend Blythewood Academy. Student number two, attend Blythewood Academy. Student number three, attend Blythewood Academy. Student, I'm gonna skip four and come back to four. Student number five, Blythewood Academy. Student number six, deny the appeal. And um, I'd like to uh, pull student number four. Blythewood Academy. Are you done? I'm done. I'm yes. Done. That, that's it. Motion been made for the students. That we are, I mean, Mr. Mann is a second out of Fleming. Second, is there any further discussion? Hearing none at this time, we're ready to vote. Motion passes 6-0. Chair will entertain a motion on student number four. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that student number four we send back to homeschool on strict probation with family services. Motion by Mr. Manning that the student be returned to homeschool on strict probation. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails with lack of a second. Chair, Mr. Chair. Dr. Fleming. Allow the student to number four to attend Adam Boyd. It's a motion by Dr. Fleming to student number four attend Adam Boyd. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by whom? Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Any further discussion by the board? Hearing none, we're ready to vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion on the contractual matter. Well, Mr. Chair, I um, have a rather long, lengthy motion. Jill and I will, sure. from the contractual matters, and I will give it to you when I finish. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that we authorize the superintendent to execute an offer and to negotiate a contract for a site for the Student Learning Center pursuant to the proposed terms authorized by the board. The offer is for the purchase of a 31 acre plus two for 31 acres plus two acres for a road in the village at Sand Hill. Should the proposed terms be accepted, the board will move to enter into contract at the next meeting. The proposed offer will contemplate a purchase price of $4 million and will not, and will not obligate the district until after after suitable due diligence after is done. Motion been made by Dr. Fleming. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Mr. Manning. Uh, any further discussion? At this time, we're going to ask Mr. Rick Ott if he will come up, uh, the contract advisor for the board, and share with both the board and the public some additional information as it relates to this motion. Mr. I. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Ham. This has been a lengthy process. We initially evaluated over 30 parcels of property. We needed between 25 and 30 acres for this particular uh, facility. Uh, we entered into negotiations with one particular piece of property. They were lengthy. We were unable to come to terms with that 
that particular site. Prior to going to our number two site, we opened up the evaluation process again. We looked at an additional four sites. In the meantime, um, we went back to our number two ranked site, and in fact, the price had come down on that site considerably. Uh, the site we proposed to you is, a, we think, an excellent deal. It will accommodate the facility, both the first phase and also the second phase. And, uh, and upon getting the due diligence done, we'll have our engineers getting started on the redesign. And I look forward to coming back in front of the board at a future board meeting and discussing the project in detail. Uh, it's a really an exciting project. It's going to provide some opportunities to students in District 2 that, frankly, we think will be a national model. And uh, kids will be able to earn college credit as well as career credit in this new facility. Any questions that I can answer for the board at this time? Any questions or comments on the board? Mr. Chair, not, Mr. Not a, Mr. Manning. Not a question, but a, a comment. Um, uh, Mr. I appreciate the work that you guys have done. That This uh, site has been one that's been on a uh, short list for a long time. Um, as you said, we worked for over a year to try to come to terms um, on a contract in another area. Um, and and uh, <coughs> incredibly, it didn't work out after a year's worth of negotiation, and, and we got sent back to the, the drawing board. Um, so I, I just want the public to be aware that this was not a, um, this has been well thought out, looked at, um, excited about the opportunities that we have on this particular piece of land for the facility um, in all its aspects. And uh, I think will fit well um, where we're proposing to, to put that. So I appreciate the work that you guys have done and the district and others in uh, bringing this together. Well, there has been a lot of hard work on district staff and the board as well in trying to, to make this a reality. Uh, all of the high schools and, and including some of the middle schools will be feeding into this facility. And so location in a central area in the district was an extremely important factor in locating a site. And uh, that was one of the reasons we were really limited as to where this, faci this facility could be located. Other questions, comments on the board? I'd also like to say that I'm, I'm excited because I really believe that uh, this student academic center is going to create an opportunity for our our future growth and it's not only going to create that opportunity to address that but it's also going to give us an opportunity to make sure that there are highly skilled academic and career education programs uh, in place um, that will allow us and allow our students to be competitive in that world uh, I think that there has been an emphasis uh, in the district uh, on the part of the district for a higher level of career and technology education but I think this is going to create an opportunity for the emergence of career and technology education along with highly skilled academic programs to uh, go beyond even where we have been in the present state. So I'm excited about it. Look forward to it happening uh, and that our district will be, as you said, Rick, a, a leader throughout the nation in terms of demonstrating um, the, the value of, of this facility. So thank you very much. If there are no other comments from the board. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion at this time? Hearing none, we're ready to vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, the new business in action requested uh, the reading achievement in grades four and five, as you know, we were going to do this before at one of my earlier board meetings, but because of the inclement weather and an abbreviated agenda, we weren't able to get to it. So at this time, Dr. Ham. Of course, being able to read is absolutely essential to success in virtually every content area. Um, you're talking about um, career readiness and those things, and I thought that I've just heard a statistic not too long ago that the reading level that's required of people who go into CAKE programs is even higher than those in many academic areas. So for everybody, being able to read is absolutely essential. Earlier we gave you a report on reading at the end of grade three. 
And this is sort of a follow-up looking at grades four and five. So Mr. Potts is going to lead off with the data and then we'll follow that with the report about how we're intervening with students to make sure that students who aren't successful in our regular reading program have interventions to make sure that they're reading at the levels that we want them to read at as well. Thank you, Dr. Ham. Mr. Chair and members of the board, as you may remember last fall I shared with a school board presentation regarding the percent of students reading on grade level uh, by the end of third grade. Uh, after that presentation, the board chair requested some additional information, specifically how fourth and gr fifth grade students are reading uh, as compared to third grade. Um, um, one way of making this comparison is through the measures of academic progress uh, or the MAP testing. Uh, uh, one of the nice things about using the MAP assessment is our, is already created and scaled uh, to be able to show performance from one grade level to the next. Um, so this instrument here will help to show that there is stability between the grade levels from one grade level to the next. This is not including the past scores. One thing that this allows us to do is see how students compare uh, to the national norms. It does not give us information about how students compare on third, fourth, and fifth grade as compared to our South Carolina cohort. Um, in third grade re reading report, um, we found that uh, about 86% of the students were reading on grade levels uh, compared to the uh, MAP, uh, MAP assessment. Uh, in this chart, we help to show the comparison of students reading on grade level as shown with MAP uh, to the South Carolina cohort. In all grade levels, you see uh, not just third grade, but students in Richland II were performing higher than uh, the grade level average uh, within South Carolina. And I think one of the, the biggest things that we noticed from uh, that third grade reading report uh, was that uh, specific factors seem to emerge uh, with the students who are not reading on grade level. Uh, we found things such as uh, nearly 80% of the students who are not reading on grade level re um, receiving free or reduced lunch. Uh, approaching 50% of those students uh, are in special ed or uh, and uh, in some cases as much as 10% of the students in a grade level receiving services already for ESOL. We saw uh, transiency being a factor that impacted students and especially um, the mobility of students after first grade. Um, and then finally, uh, students not coming to school or the truancy issue was a, another big issue impacting students. Uh, you can see uh, upwards to a quarter of the students who were not reading on grade level in some grades uh, had, were highly transient. Or <coughs> were students who um, uh, had uh, many absences. And so that, in, in general, that is really how the, the, the grade levels, third, fourth, and fifth grade compare. We see a, a performance really across all of elementary school looking very positive. Uh, in fourth grade, uh, or in third grade, the report that I gave to you last time was 86% of the students in Richland II reading on grade level. And in fifth grade, using MAP and PASS combined, 89% of the students are reading on grade level. So we have a pretty small percentage of students, many of them already receiving specialized services, but those that aren't receiving specialized services are receiving services in other ways throughout the district. Dr. Ham? I'll turn it over to Mrs. Millett. Thank you, Dr. Ham. Um, you did receive in your packet previously some information. 86% um, is good. It's not great. And we realize that we want every child to, to be able to read. And what we did, really, we had to have a, pl a plan in place. And so we did a needs assessment. And as you read, there are some uh, areas that we found that were really lacking that we needed to focus on. Um, screening, for example, in, in K2 um, was there, but it was not always implemented. Um, there was no consistent screening or benchmarking system in place throughout the district. It was different places, different programs. Students were pulled from reading to be taught reading. They're missing their original or their core area of reading, and that was a, a concern of ours as well.
Um, we do know that special ed students and ESOL and a variety of students do com comprise these folks, but what we wanted to do is share with you briefly what we've done and what we're continuing to, to do to increase um, that. We've realized significant changes need to be made and we were able to hire four intervention services uh, specialists. And uh, some of the responsibilities you see up here on the list, um, most importantly, is that they know how to look at data. They know how to assess students. They know how to work with teachers. They know um, how to establish a robust intervention program. And so as we looked at these four folks who are working with four schools um, in the winter of last year, we found that there were some things that we needed to actually put into place. Slide two, you have in your packet a really comprehensive description of these four tiers. But let me just point out that tier one is your core instruction for reading. And that's where some of our students were being removed to do remediation. And we're finding that they really didn't get what they needed in their core um, reading instruction because they were being pulled sometimes out of reading. And we feel like that's very important, spending the amount of time anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes in reading instruction. And so many of our students were being pulled from that and placed immediately into tier two. And we saw that as a problem as well, because those students were getting assistance from teaching assistants. Some were doing um, pulling out, some were doing small group, but it wasn't a comprehensive program. And the program that we did choose to do, and you see it outlined here, is called our uh, response to intervention, tier four intervention. And so students are progress monitored now on a regular basis. They are placed in a program that after the core, after we've given them an opportunity to really learn and to absorb what the teacher is teaching, and there's still areas of concern, they're placed in small groups, tier two. They're giving, um, given instruction by teachers and or our, our RTI folks, as well as the TAs who have been trained by these um, RTI specialists. And so they are monitored again. We look at the data. What are we seeing? Are we making progress with these students? If they're not making progress, then they go to tier three, which is even more intensive uh, small group almost and sometimes individual uh, instruction. Uh, based on their needs then, if they are not making progress throughout, then tier four, they uh, sometimes will go with the IET team. They're brought up there to see if, if perhaps these folks or these students should go into uh, special services. And so if you'll see on um, slide three, uh, we have four currently RTI specialist, and in the winter of 2013, they started with one school each. Now this year, they're doing two schools, so you see it's, it's going to be a ripple effect. Um, and by their building that capacity in the schools that they started with, and then continuing with the schools that they started with last year and continuing uh, to work with new schools, you can see that base beginning to be built. And we're excited uh, about that as well. Um, in the next slide, we've got um, Killian. I think in, in your packet, we gave Killian as an example. Killian was one of the first schools, uh, as was Windsor, as was uh, Forest Lake, and Keels. And uh, we decided to sort of showcase Keels. And you can see the number of students who are in Tier 2 and Tier 3. But what's amazing, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that at the beginning in the fall, this is map data, in the fall, 13 students were close to reading on their grade level, but 28 were very, very at much at risk. But at the winter, after having this really robust, consistent instruction and intervention, you see now that 23 students are really at their reading level, and it's been reduced to eight who are still, and this is just the beginning, the middle of the year. And really, you can see that two thirds of the students weren't as successful as they are, uh, as they were at, at winter. And so we're hoping even in the spring, uh, we'll see some increase there.
And the next slide we have is the number of students progressing to grade level. If you'll look, you have um, 200, about 241 students who were not reading on grade level. This is Killian School only. And after their intervention, what we found was there was a dec decrease in 33 students. 33 students were transitioned out of that intervention so that they could be successful. And so that dropped it down to, I think, um, 208 students that um, needed intervention services. Um, and these, um, this data is based on MAP, it's based on Dibbles, it's based on DRA, and other measures that are scientifically researched that our folks have put into play. Um, and we're excited about the, the um, progress that our students are making. This is, has been true across the other schools as well. So we feel like we have placed in our district a really good program that will continue to help our students be successful in reading because 86% is not good enough for us. We want it to be 100% if possible. Um, we know that the teachers need knowledge and understanding of how to teach reading. Um, we know that they need to know how to differentiate. We know they need to know how to um, read and understand data and apply that to those decisions. And so we'll continue to provide professional development in those areas, reading courses, differentiated instruction, uh, one-on-one kinds of things. That come. The state is offering some programs this summer that teachers can participate in can participate in as well. And so uh, we feel like we have put in place a systemic plan to help our children be successful reading. And tonight, if, if you have some questions, we have with us Dr. Robert Scotland, Dr. Crotwell, who is the RTI specialist at Killian, and of course our own Dr. Marsha Mosley. So any of us will be happy to answer some questions. Questions and comments from the board. Thank you, Ms. Millett. Um, thank you, Ms. Potts. Questions from the board? Ms. Spector. So, can, you might not have this in front of you. If not, you can okay. give it to me later. Okay. But in the chart where you went from 28 then to 23 using Kiel students, how many students was the total that you pulled from? Okay. I'm going to let. I'm, I'm just trying to get the vision in my head. Dr. Crotwell can give you that specific information. Well, when I came in in January, um, we had um, 113 students served an intervention from, kin from kindergarten to fifth grade. Um, we only dismissed five. I started in January. We had to get the program up and running effectively. Um, we had to put data in our decision making, and we had to train a lot of folks um, in getting this to be um, effective RTI program. So we dismissed five at the end of the year. This year we started with 128 children um, in tier two, um, tier three intervention for kindergarten through fifth grade, and we've dismissed 33 students um, from tier two back into the classroom. And that's the whole goal of RTI, is to get them back into the classroom. We're giving them an evidence-based intervention, a little boost, because they're behind academically. Um, we're giving them that boost, that six weeks of intervention, um, so that they can get back into the classroom and be more successful. So that's the whole goal and process of this RTI program. Did that? follows those students once they go back into the classroom in case they are not? We progress monitor them. Um, our tier two children and tier three children are progress monitored weekly. When they are dismissed, it's not that we forget about them. And that's what's so great about this process is that we're not letting children fall through the cracks because we have our eyes on every child. So when they go back into the classroom, we're still progress monitoring them. We're not doing it as frequently as we do our tier two and tier three children, but we are progress monitoring them every three weeks. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Manning. Um, do, do we know how many homes where the children can't read that we have one or more parent at home that can't read? It, it, do we know where we have a child in our classrooms that are struggling with reading or can't read? How many of those have one or more parent at home that can't read? I don't particularly have that information. I think maybe Mr. Cunningham or someone that, that is going through uh, adult, the adult ed programs. But, you know, we would have to be invasive, I would feel, to find that out from a family. We, um, you know, sometimes in, in the teaching position, you find that out inadvertently, mm -hmm. but you couldn't really pry to ask that information. Right. I, I guess I'm just asking from a support standpoint. 
right, at home and over the summer. Yeah. And so how do we address that? You know, we address it in the schools, but how do we address those in-between times when we don't have them? Thank you, Mr. Manning. What we're um, proposing to do at uh, the, some of these schools is to have an extended year summer program, if you will. Um, I think Keels highlighted theirs last year. It was very successful. They are going to do it again this summer and extend it. Um, working with parents, our parent educators, that's still an area that we really need to focus on and, and make sure that we are addressing. Um, we do have st uh, parents who do not read, and they are very embarrassed to let us know that they don't read. Um, so we're trying every way we can to, you know, find that out. But working with the parents, we know that's critical. And having the teachers understand, the classroom teachers understand where the students are academically and where they need to be, they can better help with the guidance of our RTI specialist, provide um, suggestions and some materials even that we can uh, pass on to our, our families. Other questions, comments from the board? Let me say, I certainly rec recognizing and looking at the numbers uh, of students who uh, are having factors beyond their control, in many cases, uh, impacting their performance in the classroom and, and looking at what a high percentage, high correlation there is between those factors and their challenges in reading. Just I applaud the, the work that you're doing, trying to overcome some barriers that we really don't have a lot of control over uh, and that happen outside of the classroom. So I applaud you for that. I, I wouldn't make one, one request to, to consider, because I'm not sure how frequently you use the term, I don't necessarily like like the word dismiss. It, ha it sounds like kind of a punitive negative. I would rather you ask you, maybe ask you to consider maybe promote it back to the classroom or something that gives more of a positive. Because until you explained it, when you said dis dismiss to me, I was thinking something negative, to be quite candid with you. I said, uh, so just as a thought, but maybe another term other than dismiss. Um, but thanks for sharing the strategies, uh, Jeff, as well as uh, Sue, in terms of what you're doing to, to make a difference in, the, in that 14, 12, 14 percent that, that are not quite there yet. It's a great job. Great job. Thank other you. comments or questions? Ms. Brill. Um, are there plans to go into any, any of the other elementary schools, or do you need to hire more intervention specialists? Well, interesting that you asked that. <laughs> I'm going to let Dr. Scotland <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. And let me just say that having a person specifically for this mm -hmm. has been phenomenal for our school. And I think some people want to keep me at Kiel's, but we're really talking about Killian here. Um, but um, Dr. Crotwell came in, and one of the biggest pieces she has played for us is looking at the data, being able to really keep her eyes on that, go back to the teachers, have those discussions based on the data, making the data uh, decisions about the students <laughs> and the collaboration piece. That's a significant collaboration piece between the teacher uh, the teaching assistants doing the intervention, and Dr. Crotwell, and of course, the administration. And so in terms of what it means to kill and to have a person there, Dr. Crotwell, as you see, is going to be leaving us going to another school. But we see this position being so important, we have maneuvered our funds in such a way that we're hiring a person from some other funds to be able to continue this on because it's a perfect model, in my opinion, and it's taking us in the direction that we need to go but sustainability is the, is the issue. Sure. And so I'm saying that to say there is a need, in my opinion, and of course my opinion is just that, uh, for a person of this nature in other schools because to start and then move <coughs> off and there's nobody to pick it up, just kind of kind of leaves you back where you were, but to have someone to come in, pick it up, and continue. So we have a person come in that's going to be trained by her, get the professional development that they need, so that next year we'll have a person in place to be able to continue this because that's the only way we're going to have this contingency for students who will come following the ones that have that now and so forth. Because we get them at K through second grade, learn where they learn to read, then certainly after that they can read to learn. And that's a part of what this program does for us in a very phenomenal way. So uh, I cannot say thank you enough for Killian for uh, allowing her to come be a part of us. Uh, <coughs> It has really made a difference, and I see that this type of effort is going to continue to make a difference for our students as they matriculate through kindergarten. Thank you, Dr. Elements. And I'll continue to make it one of my budget priorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Other questions or comments from the board? Jeff, I'm wondering if is there is something in this program as a model that we might want to consider emulating, uh, particularly for the area of math, where we're also struggling in some of those grade levels as well, just as a thought. And we are doing that, that yes. We, we are. Reading was first. Math is coming. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Other questions coming from board? Thank you very much. <coughs> Next one, I, 
<clears throat> excuse me, next on our agenda is improving academic achievement and instructional technology update. Dr. Ham? Yes, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Cramner and Ms. Toiber to make this report. Sure. And um, if you recall, we gave you sort of a matrix of things we were doing to improve academic achievement, working on the Common Core, K-12 uh, mathematics, middle school curriculum, et cetera. This is one of that series, and so while we're doing a whole lot of things with instructional technology, the real focus here is going to be how are we using technology to improve academic achievement. With that, I'll turn it over to Donna Teuber, who's the lead for our instructional technology team. I'm first. Or maybe I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cranmer, who's going to kick this off. Uh, just as an introduction, I think, I think it's accurate to say that these are exciting times in Richland, too, and certainly exciting times for technology in particular in Richland too. Uh, our instructional technology continues to be an essential component of the learning experience for our students and that's good news for the 21st century learners. Teachers are teaching with technology, students are learning with technology, and we believe that they are benefiting from, from those opportunities. Uh, just one of our biggest projects is the one-to-one -one computing project, which was completed at the beginning of this school year. And that means that now every student in grades 3 through 12 has uh, their own computing device. And that's just an awesome achievement for the, the district and with the board's leadership. And that's uh, really something that we believe is going to take us uh, uh, many miles down the road. And with that, I'd like to introduce Donna Toiber, who will give us an overview of the remainder of the report. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and we have some of our technology integration specialists here as well as some technology and learning coaches. So we're excited to be able to share what we've been doing with technology in the school district. Uh, you can see these are students at Summit Parkway after they received their uh, computers at the beginning of the school year. But as uh, Mr. Cramner mentioned, we are fully one-to-one -one now with grades 3 through 12 and that would be over 21,000 students who now are one-to-one -one in their classrooms. Uh, so that is a great achievement that we've uh, made in the last two years. And we have also um, had a lot of infrastructure upgrades. We're now at two gigabits per second for our um, internet uh, speed. And so our students are, um, our bandwidths, our students do have access to resources throughout the school day and we aren't maxing that out yet, which is fantastic. So we're very excited about that. Um, we are seeing that our learning environments are uh, better because we do have the opportunity to provide our students with a wide range of technology tools and resources. And with those tools and resources, our teachers are able to differentiate instruction more. They're able to put content online so that students and parents can access it. Uh, and accessing some of the electronic uh, digital resources I'll tell you about also. But it gives our teachers the opportunity to take learning outside of the walls because those students can take their devices with them. They can go out into the hallway. It's very a mobile technology that they're able to uh, learn where they are and they're able to work collaboratively in groups. And we feel that that's a great benefit as we move toward implementing the Common Core. Uh, this is an example of how digital resources are being used in Richland School District 2. Uh, we have long had um, Streamline SC, which is also um, officially called Discovery Streaming by Discovery Education. That's been provided through our state for a number of years. Uh, but this chart can show you what can happen when you do have one-to-one -one devices and provide great professional learning for teachers and then um, having the students uh, actually actively involved with Common Core activities using the resource. You can see in the red, uh, right around October is when we, uh, the, the students were imported into Discovery Streaming so that all students would be able to access audio and, vis and videos and some image uh, libraries and assignments created by their teachers. And then you can see what happened after the training uh, that we have had a huge increase in the use of that uh, resource. And that's a resource that has been provided for us through the state, but we really feel that um, having the technology tools and also having the focus on the Common Core and having our students having uh, needing to listen and to have uh, things to view and then to 
do research projects has helped with the usage of that, that resource and, and ma maximizing our use of the resource. So we're working on maximizing the use of our, our resources. We do have what's called the Digital Starter Kit in Richland too. We have a committee that came up with a list of resources that can really support teaching and learning in the classroom. And we've made a conscious effort to provide technology staff development for all teachers on these resources so that they can use those with their students and so that they feel that uh, you know they're comfortable with it. Uh, how to use it so that they can then go and apply that in the classroom. And you can see that we have a wide range of digital resources uh, that we have in our district, and this is just a, a small number of resources that our teachers are using. But the starter kit gives teachers a place to start. For our new teachers, it's a place to say, these are resources I know that I can go to someone, my technology coach, and they'll be able to help me know how to use this in the classroom. And we're not limiting the resources teachers can use, but we want them to focus on the resources that will support instruction and, and learning. Uh, and to that um, extent, we have changed a job title. Um, our instructional technology specialists are now called our technology and learning coaches. We adapted uh, the ISTE, International Society for Technology and Education, uh, coaching standards for technology coaches to uh, give ourselves a new job description. It's really very similar to the job description that the ITS did have. But the focus is to align it with those coaching standards and to make a, a point that our technology coaches are working with teachers in the classroom and helping them with uh, defining best practices for using the technology in the classroom. And so that has been something that we've been working very hard on to provide the technology coaches with staff development so that they can work well with teachers and provide that modeling and that and giving them some feedback on lessons to better and better use the technology with students. Uh, we also have been working very closely with uh, academics with the Common Core implementation. This has been a major focus this school year. Um, our, our folks have all been involved with the Common Core implementation planning and we have had professional development that incorporates the technology and that's so important. The umbrella is the, is the curriculum and then under that umbrella is the technology and the resources that can enhance that and, and help to make um, the learning environment, the type of place where students can, act, can learn those uh, standards very, um, very well. And so you can see that this is from our SC Midlands Summit. We had about 550 teachers attending that last summer, but we've uh, provided a lot of different opportunities for teachers. We have provided them with uh, workshops. The technology coaches all have a professional learning plan in place at their school and provide teachers with a number of opportunities to attend professional development. And then it has been incorporated into the district level professional development days so that teachers have an opportunity to have hands-on because they tell us they need time with the technology and time to practice. That's something that we're, we're working on finding new and creative ways to provide them with time to practice. And we're also uh, having some courses are virtual and some courses are a blend of face-to-face -face and virtual assignments. Uh, technology leadership is so important. With a one-to-one -one initiative as large as ours, we need our principals and assistant principals to be on an even playing field, to understand what it means when they go into a classroom, to see how technology is being used and just to understand what they're seeing. And so they have been attending technology leadership. This is our second year. Uh, we have a leadership session before key leaders each month for principals. And then we've also incorporated technology leadership into all of the assistant principal meetings that the academics holds. And we have an e evening option for principals and assistant principals who'd like to come and have more, of a, more time to practice. And we cover some of the implementation factors that will lead to success with a one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, we cover common core skills and 21st century skills and that's been very successful. We very, have a very high participation in the um, technology leadership series. We also have many, uh, been collaborating a lot with other districts around the United States and Canada and really other countries to put best, best, practice for, best practices for the use of technology into 
place. We are a Project Red Signature District. We've also been active in the COSIN Teaming for Transformation Network. And through those collaborations, we've really learned a lot and we're sharing what we've, we've learned. And we also have a number of strategic partnerships with uh, different vendors who we work with and they provided with us with a lot of necessary <coughs> professional development and additional assistance with things like the SC Midland Summit with uh, vendor tables and even more importantly, they provided us things that um, can actually experiences for the kids. These are students at Dent Middle School who were part of a digital literacy program put on by Google, um, You Are What You Share. And it was a great opportunity for our students to really hear from some experts about how to be safe online. Uh, and our technology plan is uh, in the process of being uh, recreated for the next three years. So we do have a group that will be pulled together to work on thinking about the next steps with technology in Richland School District 2 because we have done some really wonderful things in the last few years and we want to continue to keep our eye on what is important and how we can make that better in our district with instructional te technology as well as with all of the other aspects of the technology in our district. And I just would um, be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Donna. Any questions from the board, comments from the board? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Manning. We were at the, uh, um, at our school board conference uh, the <coughs> weekend, and uh, I, I tell you, any of you guys who deal with our technology could have given the talks that I saw there. Um, we are ahead of the curve, and I can't tell you how many people came to ask us um, or myself specifically about what we're doing because they know that we are leading uh, in this area. And uh, they're just amazed to find out how far ahead we really are with this. And so I applaud you guys for the work. Um, I know uh, slightly in the same area, but off topic, I've been working with uh, IT on a security audit. And again, no surrounding districts have done a security audit for their school district. So we're inventing the wheel as we go. And uh, I'm very proud of the work that you guys are doing. Um, and teachers and staff, and I, I thought that the one young man had a great comment that Digital Native really has nothing to do with your age. It has to do with those who are willing to take the time to invest in learning and using the technology and becoming comfortable. And I see we have a district full of digital natives. And uh, so I, I applaud you guys for getting us there. Thank you. Ms. Manning, other questions or comments on the board? Um, Ms. Would Brewer? she recognize her staff? I know some yes. of them. Yes, yeah, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Colin, Marianne Cincinnati Wood, Lisa Noach, Pam Hanflin, <laughs> Linda Brown, and then we've got some technology and learning coaches, Kim Ryan and Linda Fitz. Linda Fitz. And Sheila Edwards. Yeah. And I can't Other see. questions or comments from the board? Donna, let me say, I, I remember Dr. Ham uh, applauded you for the work you did in, in conducting the very first summit several years ago, and to, listen, to see how it has grown uh, so exponentially since then, uh, speaks to, as Mr. Manning said, um, not only the work that we're doing in our district, but the, the, as a leader across the state. Uh, a question maybe more for you, Tom. Um, is there a plan for, or what is the plan for replacing the uh, upgraded and uh, updated equipment that we sort of swap out, that we, we bought through this process? What, can we, is there a plan for that? Uh, you're referring to the one-to-one? -one? Yes, sir, specifically the one-to-one. We're, we're planning for a four-year replacement mm -hmm. cycle on those. And uh, you will recall uh, back when we worked on the planning stages for this that uh, we are uh, reducing our inventory of Windows computers to free up uh, funding within the capital budget so that we can provide that four-year rotation uh, of the one-to-one -one devices. So we believe we can do that on a relatively flat budget when it comes to the amount of investment that's going into uh, maintaining the obsolete or you know replacing uh, obsolete computers. So essentially a four-year uh, cycle. And are we in the third year of that four-year cycle now? We are in varying stages of that. We right. did it. We had a three-phase rollout right. of the of the uh, project, which is uh, in large part by design, so that it wouldn't all become obsolete at the same time. And uh, we are you might might have seen in our eight percent budget. We are increasing or accelerating two schools on that for a, a number of different reasons, but uh, we're at, our oldest equipment is in its third year right now for, for the one-to-one. -one. 
Thank you very much. Other questions, comments on the board? Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Next on our agenda is our report on our IV program. Uh, Dr. Hamm? Well, as you know, we were fortunate to get a large grant to be able to implement the International Baccalaureate Program at Windsor, E.L. Wright, and Richland Northeast. And I don't think we've ever actually reported on that program to the board. And now that they are all officially designated as IB schools, we thought that would be a good thing to do. We have had the visits, et cetera, to make that happen. I'm going to call on Mrs. Millette to kick that report off, and um, she would do that, please. As Dr. Ham mentioned, um, we were fortunate to receive a grant, and really, we're one of the very few districts who have a continuum, IB continuum, from kindergarten through grade 12. And we were just uh, authorized for our middle years program, and that is at EL Wright, and it also spills into our high school program for students grades 9 and 10. But it all starts with our primary years program at Windsor. And students have opportunities to really explore and inquire uh, within their content area. And it's a blend of really questioning and exploring. And they learn those things as they continue through the um, elementary. And then middle school, they start doing more service learning, more community kinds of things. And then, of course, you get into the diploma track, which is where we're going to focus our attention now. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Bradley who is um, new to us, fairly new to us, and uh, we're delighted to have him. So he's going to share with you some of our um, highlights from our journey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. So yes, uh, as, as, as Sue was telling us about the diploma program, middle years program, um, our initial authorization for the IB diploma program was in March 2011. So our first group of two-year students beginning this journey are seniors this year. So this is our initial cohort. Um, there are 36 of them. They will sit for exams in four to six subjects this May. Um, some of them have taken one to two exams this past May. And they complete coursework in the diploma program that's assessed by the teacher. And that coursework is then externally moderated by the IB for reliability. And the school will receive feedback from the IB as to the accountability of the teacher assessing of the coursework. And that happens when results post. So um, there are, again, 36 senior candidates for the diploma. And we have an, an additional 29 students who are taking one or more IB courses as standalone. So they're not necessarily pursuing the full um, rigorous diploma program, but they're taking one or more rigorous courses that are on par with advanced placement courses. There are 31 juniors who are currently candidates for the IB diploma. There are potential of at least 50 sophomores entering for the fall of 2014. Um, so our junior senior cohort of candidates is 67 and the candidate potential for 2014-15 would be 81. And at the heart of the diploma program is the core, where students take a two-year course over the junior, senior year in critical thinking called the theory of knowledge. They also have to document over 150 um, minimal, that's, that's a minimum of hours of reflection and everything they're doing um, experientially to, to uh, advance the mind, the body, and the soul through creativity, action, and their community service. And these are all portions that are um, coordinated centrally, and then we rely on staff with release time to help even further coordinate um, those aspects of the program. Students also write a maximum of 4,000 words research essay called the extended essay. These are assessed externally. They pick a topic of interest. They work with a teacher who serves as a supervisor. It's around 40 hours of recommended working time for the candidate and around three to five hours of time by the supervisors in meeting with students about their research process. So that's a little bit about the diploma program. I'll come back to that in a second. But I did want to highlight our MYP authorization from January 2014 in partnership with E.L. Wright. We're very excited about this recent authorization. 
but it's important to, to recognize, and I'm just like to give the report to the board and, and the audience, that the MYP is intended to be an inclusive program that can cater to all students. This is essential. Um, the MYP uh, is founded upon communication, intercultural awareness, and holistic learning, so that interdisciplinary relatedness is, is, is uh, tantamount. It's, an, it's a framework that requires students to study eight subject groups. And in addition to studying their own language, they have to pursue a world language, humanities, science, mathematics, arts, physical education, and, te and technology. And those subjects are pursued in each of the five years. It's for that reason that our school is currently supporting um, a more modified scheduling approach. Um, the, the necessity for students to be pursuing two languages and the, um, the magnet programs that our school offers. Um, you know, currently now we offer seven, seven courses for students and a modified schedule, we would be able to offer eight and students would be able to have concurrency of learning that will last in each year of the program and students would have the appropriate contact in their language, not only their native and English, but their pursuit of the second language. This is just a little bit to show you, um, this is the global distribution of total points in the diploma program. Um, these are results from last year. Students in their six subjects need to average fours to earn the diploma. The global average is around 30 points. Um, and the results from this year's candidates will be posted July 5th to coordinators, teachers, administrators, school dignitaries. And July 6th, students have access via PIN and secure website to access the results. They also have access to a coordinator at that time. Um, this is a snapshot of school statistics from last May, and one of the key subjects we had the most students registered in that gives us a, a, the biggest picture of where we are. Um, environmental Systems and Societies, this was a one-year science course. There were 30 students. The highest grade was a six. The lowest grade was a two. IB subjects are scaled on a one to seven scale. Um, our average grade as a school was a 3.53. Globally, that subject average is a 4.22. So we, we are, I'm, I'm very happy with those results and I'm looking forward to the continued growth in that regard. Our students in the middle years program, back to our program for all ninth and 10th graders, sorry, switching gears here again. All students in grade 10 complete a personal project. This is a wonderful, um, a wonderful stepping stone to the types of teaching and learning that happens in the diploma program. All of our, all of our students have an opportunity to, to produce a culminating activity of their own interest. Um, and it's, it, it, it helps them understand themes and concepts and issues related to the overall global context that our students are exploring in their, in their curriculum. The students' approaches to their learning throughout the process as they're learning to meet with their supervisors on time and to really follow something through that they're planning and carrying out is, is, a, is something that we value greatly. Students have flexibility. Um, to choose the, the, the topics of their own interest and to how they're going to express themselves in their project. So that helps us with our with differentiation. Examples from this current year, we have a student who's doing a dance marathon on the campus of R&E this spring. Um, that, that's a fantastic opportunity for her and for our community. Um, a student interested in learning more about the history of architecture of Turkey. Um, what's the best like to study in for optimal brain activity and memory? I want to know. Um, artificial prosthetic limbs, and uh, learning to throw pottery in the South Carolinian style. These students have to produce a process journal of the process. There's a written report they have to actually write, and then they have to actually show uh, evidence of their work. And that typically happens in our science atrium when we invite the community to be there for that wonderful opportunity. Continued goals for our school and professional development. As an IB continuum, we're greatly interested in increased opportunities for vertical articulation with our feeder schools, in addition to EL Wright, also with Dent Middle School. Um, opportunities in-house for workshops, continued authorized IB workshops for faculty, staff, and, and just really carving out professional opportunities for collaboration and reflection. Um,
those are our continued goals. This is our IB continuum, and I'd be happy to take any of your questions at this time. Questions or comments from the board? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Dr. Fleming. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned reflective time when you were talking about I would like for you to expound on that. I have no idea what that means. Absolutely. Um, when we speak about collaboration, it, it, in, in the teaching and learning that's guided through by the International Baccalaureate, um, they deem collaboration and reflection as united. So it, they don't exist without each other. Um, teachers need time to, to plan um, and to work on items related to vertical and horizontal articulation, but they also need time, um, particularly in the timetable, um, for reflection. So to reflect on on their plans. And this is actually something that's monitored by the IB. Um, the reevaluation process happens every five years, and there's a self study that's completed by um, a team of members in each school, and they have to really, you know, show evidence of, of collaboration and re reflection. So you're talking, this is a teacher. Uh, Both teachers and students are actively engaged in the process of reflection. What, that's what my, I guess yep. my question was. And, uh, okay, I guess I'll have to figure out how much time that is, but um, go ahead. Anybody, I, I may have a question. Right? Okay. Uh, other questions or comments on the board? Let me ask. I'm assuming that because I looked at the numbers and you shared with us that they're global numbers and national numbers, and I'm assuming that we will be working with Mr. Potts to after this year to have our own Richmond two numbers. Absolutely, and, yeah. And that there also will be some calibration between the students' performance on this test and those same students' performance on a P exams, SATs, ACTs, etc. Yep. So that next year we have some idea of how. That's Absolutely. That's a process I'm very familiar with. I look forward to having this data. Great. Yep. And so do we. Thank you. Other questions or comments on the board? My, my last question. Yes, sir. Last. You mentioned body, mind, and soul. I know what body, mind is. Define soul for me. Uh, in the critical thinking component, um, not only in the middle years program, we ask students to start to explore <laughs> questions about how they know what they know. So we, we begin to engage students this goes back to the PYP. Um, the exhibitions in the PYP are a wonderful example of getting students to think outside of the box about a big idea. And we take those kinds of ideas and bridge them into the middle years program for our students in grades 6 through 10, where we introduce them to essentially a, a questioning strategies that we're, that we're fairly familiar with, but they're framed in a way that allows students to think about how multiple subjects address different issues relating to knowledge and to really understand by the time they're juniors and seniors to gain a much greater understanding of not only um, themselves as knowers but the nature of academics and the various disciplines. Okay. Again, what, what does soul mean? <laughs> I know uh, you, 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 it's defined a service. Mind, you defined mind. And yeah, the, defined the cast thoughts. component, creativity, action, and service the students have to reflect on everything they're doing to get their head out of a book, as and it's core to the IB Diploma program. There are eight learning outcomes that students have to achieve. They have to try something new. They have to work collaboratively with each other. They have to explore um, and engage in activities that have global significance. So these are things that take place outside of the pursuit of the academic subjects in the student's timetable, and we coordinate that creativity, action, and service, which I feel helps students. The action is the physical. Um, the creativity can be both action and service. I mean, if, if you're running a, a service project, there's going to be a lots of action uh, involved in that project in addition to service and creativity. So. Okay, who determines global significance? Uh, the global context are, uh, are put into place by IB practitioners around the world. Um, there are over uh, 2,000 middle years programs in the world. Um, we're one of 60 continuums, and there are practitioners in the IB using the latest research in, in education, um, looking at, at, at such um, you know, a good example is some of the work from Wiggins and McTeague 
um, in curriculum planning uh, is, is a fine example of those approach to um, differentiation and looking at the curriculum and taking the curriculum and, and, and mapping it and understanding what is it that you're trying to ask students to be able to do and how can you, how can you see that they can ultimately um, have the opportunity to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes um, but ultimately be held accountable to um, criterion reference um, assessments that are, that are standardized. Okay, what if the global, these global issues you're talking about come in conflict? with the soul of District 2. Oh, absolutely. No, um, what if it clashes? Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, as it stands now, um, you know, a couple of our seniors the other day went over to um, Windsor to do some reading with students for the day. I know this is something that we see, um, but these are examples of how um, the soul of Richland 2 um, can be further, you know, the soul of Richland 2 is fantastic but we can use IB teaching and learning and, and students and their pursuit of these programs to help make them better citizens of the world. Um, and, and the work that the students have to do over their growth in the program is reflective of that growth. You know, I, don't, I really don't have any problem with the knowledge of knowing the world and the systems of the world. But when you say make them better citizens of the world, see, you're putting standards up there. You're, I mean, you're, you're placing things that that I'm not sure is the soul of the district. Too. I guess that's where I am now because I don't know what they are. And, um, and I guess that's my ignorance at this point. But I would like to further investigate that. But I am concerned of that nature because, you know, I don't know, my idea of what's a better citizen may be vastly different than what uh, IB says, so I'm just being, uh, when you get into those areas, sure. and you've been in those areas all night long explaining this, then I'm, get, then I'm, getting, I'm getting uncomfortable, so well, the citizens, that's just my. Yeah, well, if you, if you would, wouldn't mind for the reply, the citizens of R&E, for my seniors that I see, these are some of the top leaders, that, they are the leaders of today, and they will be the leaders of tomorrow. They are very well understanding of local implications and global implications. And with our world and the state it is today, I think everyone would agree that that is an absolutely wonderful place for these students to be, and they will be in a much better place as university students than they would be without this program. Mr. Chairman. Um, are, you, are you finished? Yes, I am. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, sir. That's what, Mr. Manning. Um, I would recommend, I actually attended um, training for the, uh, for the Ivy program, and uh, I would recommend to any board member who maybe is interested in finding out more about it, um, I, I think there's some training coming up maybe this summer or Absolutely. later in the year. Um, we, we have, I think, the grant, which will help fund some of that uh, while we're still covering under the, the grant. Is that correct? It's a wonderful for training. recommendation, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think it would be helpful for anybody that's trying to find out more information about it. Um, I, I think it'll help you uh, get more comfortable um, Dr. Fleming with maybe that, that idea of the global because I don't think it's really pushing an agenda from any one country's perspective it's just how do I fit and what things when I when I do something what does that mean from a global perspective or a local perspective that I fit into a bigger place than just my high school or my town or whatever um, it, it may be helpful um, if anybody's interested uh, to take that opportunity. Thank you Mr. Manning. Other questions or comments on the board? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our agenda is the proposed capital improvement on budget for 2014-2015. Dr. Ham. Dr. Miley will be leading sure. that discussion. Thank you, Chairman, board members, and Dr. Ham. Uh, on your agenda item is. Uh, the listing of the capital improvements projects. Um, as you see in your agenda item, it's a total of $1.3 million, $11.3 million, excuse me. Uh, it is primarily in two different major areas, uh, improvements to facilities, things like carpeting, painting, roofs, and one of the major projects is the roof, uh, about a $1.5 million roof. And the other component, that, that totals about $5.1 million. Uh, this is all for the 8% funding, as we've discussed earlier. Um, and the second component is $6.1 million of primarily technology, infrastructure, 
Mr. Kramer mentioned that earlier in terms of the re replacement cycle and the upgrades to the, uh, to the uh, infrastructure and the technology. Um, this is for information tonight. Uh, if you have any questions on specific items, I'll be glad to address those. Or if you would like to contact me later or Mr. Carter or Tom Cramner for specific components and items. Do you have any questions? Questions or comments on the board? Hearing none at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Molly. Thank you. Next on our agenda is our proposed, is a report, excuse me, on the second quarter financial statements. She was still there? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, this was uh, ready for our last meeting, but uh, due to the weather, uh, we've postponed it to this meeting. This is our quarterly financial reports. Um, as you know, our revenues and our expenditures are not always in sync, but we compared these back to former years, and what we found is that our expenditures are right on track in terms of our quarterly statement in terms of our second quarter. So we're right in line, nothing extraordinary in terms of our operating expenditures. Our revenues are about on pace of what they expect every year. Obviously, we've gotten more, we have more expenditures than revenues at this point, but we'll catch that up during the latter part of the year. The additional items on that, in that uh, document, we have our uh, Education Improvement Act funds. There's a, on, and I apologize, I don't have page numbers, but uh, in, we itemize the revenues and expenditures. We're uh, well in line with past practices and past years. Same thing with our special revenue funds. Um, the last uh, couple of pages, you'll find a report on the board, uh, board of trustees uh, budget. We're right in line, as for, uh, everything's in line there. There are no problems, and we're right in, on pace with former years in terms of our expenditures to date. The last two, are, the last two pages are our uh, capital improvements budgets. Uh, everything there, as you see on the, on the very, very detailed small print page, uh, is uh, our eight uh, bond referendum expenditures. We're all in line. We have the funds available for our, uh, both our next elementary school and our next, and our learning center that you talked about tonight. So everything is appropriately in line there. And the last page is our 8% funds from previous years. And as you see, we're, we've just about spent all of our 8% funds in previous years, except for uh, in our IT budget, and those are in the pipeline. They take a little bit longer to spend in terms of the, of the technology expenditures, but they're all basically encumbered. Do you have any questions? Questions or comments on the board? Thank you very much, Dr. Miley. Thank you. I, I just, want, yes, I just want to thank you. I like your format. I really do. I think I can read it very simply, or I can go to page to page and know where I am. Well, I, I, like, I really like Well, that. thank you. I will have page numbers next time. <laughs> okay. I apologize. It's okay on the iPad. It works fine without page numbers. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Next, so you have Dr. Ham. Uh, we have a report, proposal rather on the weather makeup days. Dr. Ham gave us that document earlier. Dr. Ham? Now, what we have is a proposal that's largely to engender some discussion among the board. And I thought I would start by just saying that, you know, the instructional time with our students is very important. I know there's been a lot of discussion about waiving the days that we lost due to the, the snow, but I think it's important for us to stay up front that having time, instructional time with our students is, is extremely important. The, um, options that we gave you for discussion were put together by the kitchen cabinet uh, and we met yesterday to discuss what some of the options might be and that's a representative group of school and district administrators so then I also invited Patrick Kelly our current district teacher of the year Terry Butts a former district teacher of the year so we would have teacher voices at the table as well and I thought it would be helpful. Well, first of all, we missed four days due to the snow. One of those days, and by law, we're required to build into our calendar three makeup days, which we did. Unfortunately, one of the days that we missed due to the snow was the 19th, which was one of our snow makeup days. So 
we missed one of the days that was built into our calendar. The good news was they didn't really miss that day. It was, I mean, they didn't have to be there anyway, but we missed an opportunity for a makeup that way. So I want to start by having us all look at the calendar for just a moment. You know, we, um, if you look at the days that are remaining on the calendar, I want to let you start by looking at the days that are in blue. Those are the days that are student and teacher holidays on this calendar. So when you start looking for days where potentially we could look for times to make up days, those would look, those would be logical places to look. The only ones that are blue on this calendar are the 14th through the 18th of April, which are our spring break, and the 26th of May, which is um, Memorial Day. The designated days for makeups that we already have on the calendar are March the 28th and April the 21st. So we have days designated already to make up two of the four days. When you start looking at the other times that are available in the sort of hot pink color, there are half days for elementary and middle schools on the 27th of March and the 11th of April. That are other times where we could gain some time, not necessarily days. So that's another piece of information for your consideration. Um, and again, um, pending out there is legislation or that would allow us to waive some of the days. Even we could waive days, these half days might let us make up some time, even if we couldn't. And then other time that's available for high schools are those early start days that we have those late start days that we have, where we could gain some hours that way. Again, it wouldn't count as days, but again, if we're considering instructional time, that's instructional time that we might be able to gain. So we looked at all of those options as we were considering how we might make up for some of the lost instructional time. We talked about Saturdays. We talked about tacking on times at the end of the school year. And I think one of the things all of us needed to consider and you need to consider as we discuss this is you want instructional time, but you want really meaningful instructional time, not just time where kids come, <laughs> it's at the end of the year, it's not going to be useful, I'm not going to come, or it's not going to be meaningful, or whatever. We want prime, useful instructional time. So we tried to take that in consideration as well. Um, you know, one of our principals said, if you try to make up on a Saturday, we probably have about 10% of our kids there. That's not a good use of our resources. So we consider factors like that as well. So um, the, rec the, the possibilities that we provided were to ha use our March 28th date, which is already on the calendar as the makeup date. April the 21st, again, already on the calendar as a makeup. May the 26th, which is the Memorial Day holiday, and which has the sort of academic advantage of preceding high school final exams. It's after elementary and middle school testing, but it does precede high school final exams, which is very useful from a high school perspective. And then having high schools make up some of the instructional time that they've missed by giving their late, up their late starts on March 26th, April 2nd, and April 9th. That's basically a half day that they would catch up there. And that the elementary schools would make them an additional half day of instructional time by foregoing their half day workday on March the 27th. So out of the four days, option one catches up three and a half of the four days. Option two that we listed here makes up three days, March 28th. April 21st and May 26th, so it doesn't forego the half day or the, the early the late start days. And then option three is what we think is actually the minimum number of days that we think will be required by law. And as we understand what's pending right now, and again, none of this has been settled with the legislature, is that we would be required to make uh, we would be required to use the makeup days that remain on our calendar. So because we have already missed one, we have two remaining, these would be the only two that would be required. So that's what is here for your consideration, and I <coughs> am open to any comments, suggestions that you may have. Questions or comments more? Questions? Inspector 
Dr. Ham, if we were to use option three for the March 28th and the April 21st date, is there another date that we could possibly look at without taking the Memorial holiday in option two or one? When we looked at the calendar, we did not see another date that we thought would provide useful instructional time. If you look at the calendar, we'd either be tacking one on at the end of the school year, and again, we don't think students would take that very seriously, a Saturday. And we, um, I'm just wondering how many students are going to be absent that day, even though we're having school, and who who's not already made the plans? People have made plans probably for Memorial Day. I think any day that we choose that wasn't already designated as a makeup day. And even on the makeup days, people have made plans. Oh, yeah. um, we're going to get some pushback because of that. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a legitimate question. I think, you know, when once we go beyond the days that are designated on the calendar, I think we're choosing sort of the least of the evils that are that are out there. Other questions or comments on the board? I, I, Mr. Manning, Dr. Ham, I applaud the, the work that you guys did. I agree that, um, you know, I, I think we need to use those days for instruction and, and make up as much classroom time as we can. It's the reason why we're here. And um, and, and so f for me, um, I think option number one, uh, where we make up that full amount of time, regardless of the legislature's decision to forgive those days or not, would be the way that I'm leaning. Other questions or comments on the board? I agree with Mr. Mann. Either one or two would be fine with me. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of the half days and stuff like that, if that's better served. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't, you know, I don't know how exactly everything works in the, each school. So going without the, going and keeping the half days may be more <laughs> instructionally valid than, than, than making them make the time. Up. I, I don't know, but for me, one or two would be sure. And I will tell you probably the elementary people would say that the half day makes a difference because it's a half day and that's added on at one time. That the high school of people say that those dribbles when you spread it out over a multi period day does it make, we'll make a them go whole all lot day. of difference. We'll make so them go all day. I mean why why do we have to be it doesn't make a whole lot of difference with that little well, that's what I'm saying. that little bit. Be flexible. We're talking about instruction. Let's do the best we can. Uh, Memorial Day, I hate to do it, but we didn't get too snow. We usually don't get too snow, so it's just one of those things we have to, I think, use. Dr. Ham, any other questions, comments, and more? Dr. Ham, on the statewide testing, do you know what testing is? I'm assuming PASS is going on April 1 through 3. And what testing is going on May 6 through 9? That's PASS. What's April 1, 2, 3 then? Uh, Mr. Potts, remind me what April 1, 2, and 3 is. It should be ASAP. HSAP. 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 And March 18, 19? That's past writing. Writing. Okay. What is that? So where's the, where are the makeup days for passing? I guess the reason I'm asking the question is because there's additional loss of instructional time for the for those that have to make up, and so, uh, and that's not marked on this calendar, but those would be additional days that students would be out of class. So, I guess I'm saying that to say I certainly want to echo also then what Mr. Manning and Dr. Fleming have said because there are additional days even on this calendar that are not listed where students will be missing instructional time if they're making up pass, for example. Any other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chair, I'd like Ms. to make Spectre. one other comment. Certainly. And, I mean, I'm not in the trenches, Dr. Ham, so you're going to have to let us know. But one thing I am concerned about, we're worried about making sure that the students are getting instructional time. <coughs> and I hate to be the one talking about this, but with it being Memorial Day, <coughs> how many teachers are going to be absent that day? Um, subs in the classroom. 
Well, I, th I think if we can go ahead and make that decision, I do think that that helps get, the earlier we can make the decision, the more likely it is that they'll be there. But I am quite confident, I mean, that's a big holiday weekend, that there are people who have made, you know, flight arrangements, et cetera, that, you know, they, we will have, it, it will not be ideal, it will not be perfect. We will have absentees. I know these are just questions that will get asked. No, it's a good, I mean, it's a good question. No, there's not an ideal world, so. Other questions or comments on the board? Um, just one comment. Yes, Mr. Johnson. I, I like what, um, Barbara stated because we want to make sure that principals are flexible with our teachers who are not present on May 26th. If we can just make sure that principals are flexible with the teachers who may not come that day, that would be great. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, thank you very much, Pam. Um, next on our agenda is the agenda items for our next board meeting. Dr. Ham. We'll have special recognitions, a faculty focus, the approval of the capital improvements um, budget, and approval of the inclement weather makeup days, assuming that there has been some action and we have direction from the state on how those will be waived or not waived. Any other items board members would like to add to a uh, to the next board meeting's agenda or a future board meeting agenda? Mr. Chair, yes, I would like to add um, our board policy, BA, fiscal management goals, priorities, and objectives. We need, do we need, as a board, need to go ahead and tell them what kind of percentage we want to change it to? Or Not at this time. Not at this time. Well, we'll do it when we discuss it. We're just adding to the agenda at this time. Any other agenda items? Thank you, Ms. Spector. Hearing none, thank you very much. This is our second public participation uh, on our agenda, next on our agenda. Uh, as I said earlier, no one signed up for uh, the first beyond those that spoke, and no one has signed up for the second. However, there, if there's anyone in the audience who would like to come and address the board, uh, you have an opportunity at this time to do so. Seeing none, we will move on. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, is our, uh, our next agenda item is our board and superintendent comments. Uh, at this time, I'll uh, to, uh, defer to start from our far right, uh, uh, Dr. Fleming. Oh, I thought you meant way right. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to congratulate those talented students that I saw on stage tonight. I just enjoyed performance. Of course, everything I've seen, ever seen come out of this, uh, the PCA program has been first class and with a great deal of enthusiasm. Thank you, uh, uh, Super, for the, for the uh, hosting us tonight. And we just, I think the board enjoyed our stay here because we had a long, we started at 4.30 and uh, we've been <laughs> here for a long time. Um, and the school is looking good. It's a little bit easier for me to figure out how to get around here now. I'm sure that's going to even improve the next time I come. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. Mr. Manning. Uh, Dr. Suber, uh, thank you for hosting our meeting tonight. The school is beautiful. Um, I appreciate the support of, uh, of our board um, in, in our district and really uh, reinvesting in our schools, uh, Spring Valley, Richmond Northeast, all of our schools, no matter what their age, and, and it is quite incredible. Um, my only other comment, uh, at the board conference, we had some students who came, uh, one of our orchestras came, we see the awards that our students are receiving from Blythewood, Richland Northeast, the beautiful uh, program that we had. And uh, I really appreciate that this board continues its commitment to the arts. In our district, even when we had tough economic times, we maintain that commitment. And I think it's such an integral part of our students' lives. And so I appreciate that continued uh, push that we have for our students in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. I'm going to skip all the way down to Ms. Johnson next and come back up. Thank you. I have several comments. One is I'm very excited that we have secured a location for our student center. And with that, I hope that the board 
support as well as the community and the district that we support as we move forward with this process. Mm -hmm. Courses that we're going to consider for our students because again, not all of our graduates are going to college. So I just want to put out there for the record that I hope that we have a very, very serious discussion about the courses that we offer. I'm a former Kate teacher, so I hope that we offer some of those Kate courses and courses such as welding, engineering, cosmetology, pharmacy, and, and so on. So I hope we really have a serious discussion about some of the courses that we're going to implement in the student center. Also, I'm going to put someone on the spot, Emily Manigo. Back in January, I attended a conference, SCABSI, and Emily, along with her sister, presented on special services. And I would love to see her do that at the SCASA conference in June, as well as in the district if she has not done so. So I would love to make that request. And my final comment, the students here at Richland Northeast did an outstanding performance today. So thank you to the students and thank you to Mrs. Suber. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Brill? Um, I wanted to piggyback on what Ms. Johnson was saying about the Student Career Center. Um, I don't know if you all are aware of it. It's something that we've been working on and thinking about for quite some time. And so it's great to see it come closer to reality. Um, it's allowed us to put off our bond referendum for a couple years from 2014 to 2016. And so I think that's very positive. And it's something that all of our students can participate in that have interest in the programs. And I hope we will be working, you know, along with our administration on what the programs will be. Um, but it's exciting and it puts us on the cutting edge once again. And the leadership of, of this type of program in the Southeast, in South Carolina, certainly. Um, and so it's something that other people will be emulating. And I agree with Mr. Manning. Um, there was a lot of talk about uh, technology at our meeting in Myrtle Beach this past weekend, the state school board meeting. And one was a young, young fellow still in college, Kenneth Shaw State University, who goes around the country in a mobile uh, unit and talks about technology and, and brings it into communities that don't have all that we have. And it was a really amazing presentation. And um, of course, talking to Dr. Ham, she said, well, we're already doing this. We've already had him here, and we're aware of this young man, but he was absolutely <laughs> outstanding. So that makes me doubly proud of Richland, too, always. And Sabrina, thank you. Um, school is fabulous, and I'm really excited to see it was even complicated to come in. It said follow the blue line, but I did that. And we found our way in, and it's just exciting to see all the changes, and it just looks wonderful. And I did enjoy the presentation by the Hairspray cast, and they are certainly very talented, and um, your PCA program is wonderful. Um, outstanding reports, I'm really interested in reading achievement in the fourth and fifth grades. Um, want to help support you all any way that we can. And um, the IB programs are interesting and exciting. Um, and I think I'd love to learn more about it, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, technology update is outstanding. Good work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Ms. Spector? No comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spector. I just want to say briefly, I want to echo the comments of the board. Uh, Ms. Super, and thank you very much for allowing us to be here tonight and to learn so much about um, what's going on at this absolutely fantastic school, an excellent job. And the word that's been thrown about a lot tonight in reference to other folks, it certainly applies to you, and that is great things happen under great leaders, and you are, in fact, one of those. And your tremendous leadership is why we hear and see all the wonderful things going on here at Richard Northeast High School. Keep up the good work. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Ham. Well, uh Thank Ms. Subaru, too, for letting us be here. I want to say congratulations to two of our students who are named uh, as candidates to the United States Presidential Scholars Program. That's a program that was established to recognize and honor some of our nation's most distinguished graduating high school seniors, and they're Gregory Rosilov and Akash Shingala. So congratulations to both of those young men. Um, Westwood High School was um, named one of the cool schools last week, was on TV. It was great to see you getting that honor on WIS. 
Um, the Spring Valley Orchestra, you already mentioned, was just fabulous at the conference, and I am really proud of the continued dedication to the arts and the fine performance we saw tonight is an example of that, so that's wonderful. And um, I, like the rest of the board, want to echo the sentiment, it's wonderful to see us moving forward with the Student Academic Center. I'm confident that it will be a national model for what this kind of center, the kind of emphasis we'll have there academically, and the kind of partnerships that will grow there. We will be a model for what that can look like, and I'm excited to be part of it. Thank you, Dr. Ham. Any comments from cabinet members? Hearing none, thank you very much. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, simply say aye. Thank aye. you very much. We stand adjourned. <laughs>